productive system with the label diagram and in today's session we are going to learn the structure of male reproductive system human male reproductive system structure of human male reproductive system with the diagram so this is very important uh, expected uh, laq so totally four laqs are there uh, definitely every one of you you should learn all the four laqs so that uh, among the four laqs you will be getting two laqs so now let us go with structure of human male reproductive system so human male reproductive system first of all uh, whenever you start the answer you need to start with what does they consist of human male reproductive system what do they possess what, what does they consist of so human male reproductive system consists of a pair of testes they consists of a pair of testes then they contain epididymis they contain epididymis and even they contain a pa pair of vas deferens a pair of testes a pair of epididymis and even they contain a pair of vas deferens and it they contain urethra and the male copulatory organ called as penis and apart from that even we can see some male accessory glands that which are present in the human male reproductive system so these are the different parts which are present in the human male reproductive system that is a pair of testes epididymis vas deferens urethra penis and male accessory glands so like this first you need to present what are the different parts which are present and after that you need to discuss about each part in detail so first let us go with testes so testes they are considered as primary male sex organs so a pair of testes that which are present in male so they are considered as primary sex organs and where this testes are situated so testes a pair of testes that which are ovoid in shape so they are situated outside the abdominal cavity outside the abdominal region and they are present in a pouch kind of structure that which can be called as scrotum so they are present in a pouch kind of structure that which can be called as scrotum so testes generally they descend into the scrotum by means of inguinal canals so you need to specify actually how the testes they get descend so before uh, birth actually testes they didn't get descend into the scrotum so but what happens almost you uh, know the ending of the fetal stage so this testes they get descended into the scrotum that is through inguinal canal so these terms are very very important so they get descended through inguinal canal and testes is connected to abdominal wall in last session i told you that pair of ovaries so they are connected to the abdominal canal abdominal wall by means of mesoverium i said right in the same way that is in case of female reproductive system in the same way in male reproductive system also testes is connected to abdominal wall by means of spermatic cord by means of spermatic cord and testes is connected to scrotal wall it is connected to the scrotal wall by means of gubernaculum by means of gubernaculum so like this mainly you need to specify three important terms like what is inguinal canal what is spermatic cord and even what is gubernaculum so first of all the important point which you should you should specify when you start testes is testes are the primary male sex organs which are present outside the abdominal region in a muscular 
sac or pouch like structure called as scrotum so what is the function of this scrotum so scrotum it helps in maintaining the temperature suitable for the process of spermatogenesis so the temperature suitable for the process of spermatogenesis so what is spermatogenesis so production of sperms production of sperms is uh, is only called as spermatogenesis so what is the temperature so generally the temperature will be 2 to 2.5 degree centigrade lower than the body temperature lower than body temperature so body temperature is 37 degree celsius so just 2 or 2.5 degree lower than that so that means like 34 or 35 so like that no lower than body temperature 2 to 2.5 degrees in celsius lower than body temperature so scrotum it helps in maintaining the temperature and that temperature is suitable uh, for the testes to produce sperms so like this mainly you need to specify the function of the scrotum and even here you mention why the testis is called as primary sex organ because it helps in the production of male gametes called as sperms and not only that male sex hormone or androgen which can be called as testosterone which can be called as testosterone so like this testis is called as primary sex organ because it helps in the production of the sperms and male sex hormone that is testosterone and testes are situated outside the abdominal region called as scrotum and a testis it descends into the scrotum through inguinal canals the structures called as inguinal canals and a testis it is connected to the abdominal wall by means of spermatic cord and a testis is connected to the scrotal wall connected to abdominal wall by spermatic cord and it is connected to scrotal wall by means of gubernaculum and the function of the scrotum is maintaining the temperature suitable for the process of spermatogenesis that is generally 2 to 2.5 degrees celsius lower than the body temperature then next coming to what does testis consist of so testis it consists of many testicular lobules but before that testis it is covered by means of a fibrous covering on its outside which can be which is called as tunica albugina so testis is covered by a fibrous covering which is called as tunica albugina tunica albugina and inside a serous membrane is present a serous membrane is present inside the testis so for example if this is the testis so testis is covered on its outside by means of a fibrous covering called as tunica albugina and inside the testis almost nearly some 250 testicular lobules are present so testicular lobules so like this almost nearly some 250 testicular lobules are present and each testicular lobule again it consists of one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubules so each testicular lobule again it consists of two to three or one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubules so like this again within the testicular lobules so seminiferous tubules are present so this is very very important and these seminiferous tubules they contain two types of cells so these are testicular lobules these are testicular lobules and inside the testicular lobule only what is present so that is seminiferous tubules are present inside the testicular lobules one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubules are present and each seminiferous tubule now it contain two types of cells so two types of cells are present so what are they 
so one is spermatogonia that which act as male germ cells for the production of the sperms so this spermatogonia only act as male germ cells and another type of cells is sertoli cells mainly you need to mention what are the two different types of cells which are present in the seminiferous tubules so seminiferous tubules they contain two types of cells so one type of cell is spermatogonia and the other type of cells are sertoli cells so spermatogonia they act as male germ cells which help in the production of sperms that is male gametes sperms are the male gametes and whereas sertoli cells can be called as nurse cells of the testis so why they are called as nurse cells of the testis means sertoli cells are mainly involved in providing nourishment to the sperms it is mainly involved in providing nourishment to sperms and apart from that sertoli cells they secrete an important hormone so called as inhibin so the hormone which is secreted from sertoli cells are inhibin so this inhibin it will inhibit the activity of so it will inhibit the activity of fsh that is follicle stimulating hormone that which gets secreted from the pituitary gland so this inhibin it inhibits the activity of the ss fsh follicle stimulating hormone so like this first of all testis on its outside it is covered by means of tunica albugina and inside the serous membrane is present that which consists of 250 testicular lobules and each testicular lobule again contain one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubules and within the seminiferous tubule two different types of cells are present one is male germ cells that is spermatogonia and the other type of cells are sertoli cells which which are called as nurse cells of testis because they help in providing nourishment to sperms and not only that they secrete a hormone called as inhibin that which inhibits the activity of uh, follicular stimulating hormone and uh, apart from this now in the interstitial spaces whatever are present outside the seminiferous tubules or in between them the interstitial spaces whatever are present so those interstitial spaces so they contain leydig cells again in the interstitial spaces in the interstitial spaces that which are present outside or in between the seminiferous tubules other type of cells are present that which can be called as leydig cells so these leydig cells are responsible for the secretion of the hormone called as testosterone so testosterone is secreted by leydig cells so what is the function of testosterone so testosterone is mainly responsible for controlling secondary sexual characters in male the secondary sexual characters in male and apart from that so like development of beard mustaches widening of the chest muscles so all these are you uh, know the secondary sexual characters in case of male so testosterone is responsible for controlling the secondary sexual characters in male and apart from that even it is responsible for stimulating the germ cells to uh, undergo the process called as spermatogenesis from the age of puberty from the puberty period the spermatogenesis process gets started so because of the testosterone so like this totally three different types of cells in testis spermatogonia then nurse cells of testis that is sertoli cells and leydig cells and the next coming to so like this no you need to specify mainly testis is covered by what and what does it consists of now after this seminiferous tubules now many seminiferous tubules all the seminiferous tubules they join together and they form a network called as red testis so here almost you can write like a flow chart so within the testis what actually we can see so testis testis contain testicular lobes or lobules these testicular lobules they contain seminiferous tubules 
seminiferous tubules and the seminiferous tubules they join all the seminiferous tubules they join together in order to form a red testis in order to form a red testis and again you know all the seminiferous tubules that which join together in order to form the red testis again this red testis it will form a network kind of structure that which can be called as vasa efferentia which can be called as vasa efferentia and again this vasa efferentia it open into epididymis again this vasa efferentia it open into epididymis so next we need to discuss the uh, structure called as epididymis so when it comes to testis so main important points which you should write is testis is called as primary sex organ and why it is called as primary sex organ and uh, testis gets descend into the scrotum through inguinal canals and what is gubernaculum and what is spermatic cord and apart from that testis is covered by what and inside the testis what are present like 200 to 250 testicular lobules and each uh, testicular lobule contain one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubules and what are the type of cells present in seminiferous tubules and what is their function and outside the seminiferous tubules in the interstitial spaces what are the cells which are present and what is its function that is leydig cells which help in the secretion of testosterone hormone and the functions of testosterone and apart from that now all these seminiferous tubules when they join together what do they form so that is red testis and again red testis forms vasa efferentia open into vasa efferentia and again vasa efferentia it opens into epididymis so now let us discuss the next structure which is called as epididymis so epididymis is a narrow highly coiled tube epididymis is a narrow highly coiled tube which is present at the posterior side of the testis on both sides that is on the right side and even left side so epididymis so the points which you need to mention in epididymis are epididymis is a narrow highly coiled tube highly coiled tube and in this epididymis only storage of the sperm takes place and maturation of the sperm takes place so that means storage and maturation of the sperm takes place in epididymis where the sperms will attain motility so until that sperms do not have any motility so they can't move but sperms will attain motility only in epididymis and this epididymis it is divided into three parts like caput epididymis that which arises from vasa efferentia then corpus epididymis corpus epididymis and the third part is called as caudal epididymis caudal epididymis so for example if this is testis so in the testis the seminiferous tubules everything so finally they join together red testis red testis again open into vasa efferentia and vasa efferentia it opens into a highly coiled tube so that highly coiled tube is only called as the highly coiled tube is only called as epididymis so here for example if this is red testis and red testis that which is opening into vasa efferentia vasa efferentia opens into this epididymis where this is called as caput epididymis and this is called as corpus the middle portion is called as corpus epididymis and next the highly coiled tail portion that is caudal epididymis and this caudal epididymis only will be next in connection with vas deferens so that will be in connection with the next part called as vas deferens so like this epididymis it contain three parts caput epididymis corpus epididymis and caudal epididymis 
and the functions of it is storage and maturation of sperms and the sperms attain motility. Then coming to the next part of the male reproductive system, that is vas difference. So a pair of vas difference or vas differentia. So they arise from this epididymis and they are present on both sides. So they are a pair of muscular narrow tubes, muscular narrow tubes. And what is the function of this vas difference? So vas difference, they extend through inguinal canals. They extend through this inguinal canals and they will be ascending up, ascending up where they loop over into urinary bladder, where they loop over into urinary bladder. And the main function of this vas difference is transport of sperms. The main function of vas difference is transport of sperm. So first of all, vas difference are a pair of muscular narrow tubes where they mainly help in transporting the sperms. So what this vas difference will do? So if this is testis on both the sides, so from testis, a pair of vas difference arise that which are narrow muscular tubes and these vas difference, for example, if this is urinary bladder, so where the ureters are opening into the neck of the urinary bladder. So now this vas difference will be ascending up. So where they will be loop over like this. So where they will be loop over the urinary bladder like this. And uh, by looping over the uni urinary bladder, so what will happen? They'll be joining. So like this here, semini vesicles will be present. Seminal vesicles will be present. So where they join the where they join with the duct of seminal vesicles like this on both the sides, on both the sides. So here, this side also, the vas difference will be arising. So where, so like this, vas difference will arise where it will be looping over the urinary bladder. And next, they join with the seminal vesicle duct in order to form a common duct which can be called as ejaculatory duct. So now a common duct called as ejaculatory duct will be formed. So finally we will present the diagram neatly. So like this the a pair of vas difference so they arise from the uh, epididymis they continue from the epididymis and they loop over the urinary bladder where they join with semini vesicles seminal vesicles duct in order to form a common duct that which can be called as ejaculatory duct. So this is very important point. So after looping over the urinary bladder, so what this uh, seminal vesicles will do? So this seminal, uh, this vas difference, they join with, join with the duct of seminal vesicles. They join with the duct of seminal vesicles where they will form as ejaculatory duct, where they form as ejaculatory duct. And this ejaculatory duct, it opens into urethra. The next part is urethra, it opens into urethra. So now let us discuss about the next part that is urethra. So urethra in case of the males, it is a common passage for both urine and then semen. So in case of males, urethra is also a long tube that which acts as a common passage. It acts as a common passage for both semen and urine. So for both semen and urine. So that means the semen will be transferred through urethra and even urine also will be transferred through urethra. So that's why it is a common passage for both semen and urine in case of males. 
and after this this urethra it is actually present in a organ called as penis so penis is a intromittent organ intromittent organ that which helps in the process of copulation so intromittent organ that which helps in the process of copulation and this penis it helps in ejecting the sperms into the female reproductive tract that means vagina as we have discussed in the last session so the sperms are ejected into the vagina of the female with the help of the penis and for that so now urethra will be passing through the penis only and this penis it is made up of with the tip of the penis first of all the tip of the penis is called as glans penis the tip of penis is called as glans penis and this glans penis it is covered by means covered by a loose skin loose folding of skin that which can be called as prepuce that which can be called as prepuce so like this the tip of the penis is called as glans penis and a glans penis is covered by a loose folding of the skin called as foreskin or it can be called as prepuce and this penis portion consists of different tissues like it consists of a pair of carpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum so it consists of a pair of corpora cavernosa corpora cavernosa a pair of corpora cavernosa are present on the lateral dorsal side so dorsal side but laterally and whereas mid ventrally whereas mid ventrally so corpus spongiosum is present so mid ventrally corpus spongiosum is present so what is the function so this corpora cavernosa so they contain a specialized tissue with blood filled spaces so it contain a specialized tissue with blood filled spaces that which help in the erection of penis that means making the penis stiff strong and rigid during the time of ejaculation of sperms into the female reproductive tract so like this mainly these tissues will help in making the penis strong and erectile during the process of copulation so like this mainly you need to mention uh, important points about penis like it is a male external genitalia or intromittent organ which help in the process of copulation that is by ejaculating the sperms into the female reproductive tract or vagina and the tip of penis is only called as glans penis that which is covered by a loose folding of skin called as prepuce and it consists of corpora cavernosa on the dorsal side the two laterally and mid ventrally it consists of corpus spongiosum so corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum so they are present in the penis so these are the important points about penis next finally coming to accessory glands present in male so let us see what are the accessory glands that which are present in the male let us see what are the accessory glands which are present in the male so the accessory glands present in the male reproductive system are a pair of seminal vesicles so seminal vesicles they are present on the posterior inferior side of urinary bladder seminal vesicles are present on the posterior inferior side of urinary bladder as i have shown you already so they are present on the posterior inferior side of urinary bladder and these seminal vesicles are responsible for secreting almost 60% of seminal fluid or semen so 
if you consider the semen overall as 100% in that 60% of the semen uh, is secreted by seminal vesicles and what does it consist of? So the seminal fluid, whatever secreted by this seminal vesicles, it consists of fructose, it consists of fructose, then potassium, citric acid, prostaglandins, prostaglandins. So like this, different types of substances are present in the seminal fluid. In this fructose is mainly responsible for giving energy to the sperms. So the energy for the sperms is mainly acquired with the help of this uh, sweetest sugar that is fructose. The next coming to prostate glands. So prostate gland is only one in number. It is not a pair. So prostate gland is one in number. And this pro prostate gland is present at the posterior side of urinary bladder. Urinary bladder after the seminal vesicles. And this prostate gland contributes to 15 to 30 percent of the seminal fluid or semen formation. So, 15 to 30 percent of the semen is because of the secretions of this prostate gland only. And this prostate gland secretion, it is slightly acidic in nature. It is slightly acidic in nature. And this secretion mainly helps in activating the sperms. So they mainly help in providing activation of sperms. And not only that, even it help in providing lubrication. So for the sperms, for the motility of the sperms easily. So it helps in activation and then lubrication of the sperms or mainly it helps in transport of sperms. It helps in transport of sperms. So that is about prostate gland. And then next to finally coming to Cowper's gland or bulbourethral gland. Finally coming to Cowper's gland. Cowper's gland can also be called as bulbourethral gland. So this Cowper's gland or bulbourethral gland are also a pair in number. A pair in number. And the secretions of Cowper's gland mainly helps in neutralizing the urethra, neutralizing the pH of urethra. Because as I told you already, urethral passage is the common passage for both semen and urine in male. So uh, before copulation, if the male has passed out the urine, so the urine pH is uh, slightly acidic. So because of that, the urethral passage would have become acidic. And during copulation, when the sperms pass through that uh, acidic environment, the sperms may die. In order to prevent that, so the Cowper's gland secretions, mainly they contain alkaline substances that which help in neutralizing the pH of the uh, urethra. So like this, Cowper's gland secretion also helps in uh, transport of sperms and then neutralizing the pH of the urethra. So that's why they are called as accessory glands because their secretions only together, it will form as semen and through the semen only, sperms will be passed out. Uh, finally, uh, no, that is urethra. And here, the tip of the urethra, the tip of the urethra is only called as urethral orifice. The tip of urethra is called as urethral orifice, so through which urine and the semen will be passed out. So like this, in male reproductive system, you need to remember uh, different parts, uh, that is testis and after testis, what is epididymis, what are the parts of the epididymis, that is three parts of epididymis and the function of the epididymis is, that is uh, storage of the sperms, maturation of the sperms, where sperms will attain motility and after epididymis, a pair of vas difference which are long tubes that which help in transport of sperms and they loop over the urinary bladder by extending through inguinal canals and finally they join with the seminal vesicle duct to form ejaculatory duct and this ejaculatory duct continues or opens into urethra that which is actually coming from the urinary bladder and after vas difference 
you need to remember about urethra which is a common passage for both semen and urine in male and the opening opening it of uh, is only called as the opening of the urethra is only called as urethral orifice urethral orifice or external urethral meters or opening urethral orifice it can be called as and finally penis which is a copulatory organ so the tip of the penis is glans penis covered by a loose fold of skin called as prepuce and it consists of corpora cavernosa on both the sides and corpus spongiosum midventrally and apart from that you need to discuss what are the different accessory glands that which are present so that is seminal vesicles a pair of seminal vesicles but prostate gland is only one in number and a pair of cowper's gland or bulbo urethral gland so this is the explanation of male reproductive system so then you can show the diagram with the labeling diagram with labeling of male reproductive system so as i told you you can show a pair of testes that which are present in the outside the abdominal region in the pouch or sac like structure that which can be called as scrotum and in one of the testes even you can show that uh, as i have showed you already the testicular lobules with uh, semini ferrous tubules all that you can show so where each one is containing one to three seminiferous tubules and the seminiferous tubules of different lobules they join together and form as a red testis so they join together and they form as a red testis so finally red testis it opens into a network that which can be called as vasa efferentia and vasa efferentia together opens into epididymis epididymis like this so actually internally only internally from the testis only that epididymis will arise to outside and now this epididymis it continues with what it continues as vas deferens and before that here you can show the centrally the urinary bladder and uh, where into the neck of the urinary bladder ureter so this is ureter and this is urinary bladder so here the vas deferens so where they loop over can show like this and from this side also so this side directly you can show with the uh, vas deferens so directly you can show from the testes whatever the vas deferens which is arising the vas deferens can also be called as spermatic duct vas deferens can also be called as spermatic duct so now the vas deferens whatever comes from both the sides they join with what as i told you at the posterior inferior surface we are having seminal vesicles with the duct and where this vas deferens also now they join and finally they form as a common duct finally they form as a common duct which can be called as ejaculatory duct 
here ejaculatory duct is formed and uh, posterior to that even prostate gland is present and that ejaculatory duct it continues as what it continues as urethra that ejaculatory duct continues as urethra that which will end up with the opening called as urethral opening which will end up with the opening called as urethral opening or urethral orifice then after this even apart from prostate gland even it consists of a pair of cowper's gland so you can show the cowper's gland below the prostate gland so this is seminal vesicle and this is prostate gland seminal vesicle prostate gland and next this is cowper's gland or bulbo urethral gland and so the urethra it passes through a copulatory organ so that which is called as penis so it passes through a copulatory organ that which is called as penis so this is penis and this is urethra so like this you can present testes then vas deferens urinary bladder then seminal vesicle prostate gland cowper's gland the urethral tube and the male copulatory organ that is penis so this is the structure of male reproductive system the next moving to with this all four lqs we have completed so the next moving to one of the important uh, saq already saqs also we have completed from digestion and absorption chapter three important saqs i told you structure of tooth digestion of proteins in stomach and uh, <clears throat> digestion of proteins in stomach structure of tooth we have completed and in uh, respiration chapter yesterday i have completed transport of carbon dioxide so now coming to another important uh, saq from respiration human respiratory system that is how respiratory movements are regulated in man so that saq let us discuss today so the question is how are respiratory movements regulated in man so that means here mainly we should discuss about regulation regulation of respiratory movements where it is controlled by neural mechanisms that is regulated by neural mechanisms so the question is saq short answer question how are respiratory movements how are respiratory movements regulated in man so the respiratory movements are regulated in man by means of neural systems or neural mechanisms further there are different centers in that the first center is called as respiratory rhythm center respiratory rhythm center so this answer you can present easily in the form of side headings so by presenting what are the different centers that which control the process of respiration so respiratory rhythm center it is present in medulla oblongata that is a part of that is medulla oblongata is a part of hind brain hind brain of brain so 
respiratory rhythm center is present in the medulla oblongata of brain and this respiratory rhythm center is mainly responsible for controlling or regulating the respiratory rhythms respiratory rhythms means what inhalation and then exhalation so respiratory rhythms are regulated by respiratory rhythm center present in medulla oblongata then coming to second one pneumotoxic center so what is this pneumotoxic center so pneumotoxic center is present in pons varoli pons varoli which is a part of brain stem of and again this pons varoli is also part of hind brain only so pneumotoxic center is present in pons varoli which is a part of brain stem or which is a part of hind brain so generally pons varoli give signal give signals to this respiratory rhythm center which is present in medulla oblongata so that means once again respiratory rhythm center is also regulated by pneumotoxic center present in pons varoli so the signals which are coming from pneumotoxic center to this respiratory rhythm center so mainly it reduces it will give signals to the respiratory rhythm center in such a way that to reduce the duration of inhalation to reduce the duration of inhalation thereby altering the breathing rate in such a manner so like this pneumotoxic center will be regulating the respiratory movement by giving signals to the respiratory rhythm center present in medulla oblongata so thereby altering or mainly reducing the duration of inhalation or inspiration thereby the breathing rate also will be modified accordingly and the next center is chemosensitive area chemosensitive area so this chemosensitive area it is present adjacent to the respiratory rhythm center it is present adjacent to respiratory rhythm center in brain and as the name indicates this chemosensitive area it is sensitive to increase in co2 and h plus ion concentration it is sensitive to increase in co2 and then h plus ion concentration so whenever the carbon dioxide and h plus ion concentration increases then this chemosensitive area so it will give signals again to this respiratory rhythm center and make necessary adjustments so in order to eliminate this excess carbon dioxide and h plus ions whatever present so either by increasing the breathing rate so like this chemosensitive area which is present adjacent to the respiratory rhythm center so it is sensitive to increase in co2 and then h plus ion concentration and because of this so what happens they will be making necessary adjustments in order to remove this uh, excess carbon dioxide so by increasing the respiratory rate and fourth one is the receptors chemo receptors so the receptors present particularly in carotid arch and aortic arch carotid arch and aortic arch so they also detect the changes in these receptors also detect the changes in co2 and then h plus ion concentration and accordingly they will be giving signals so in order to uh, modify the rate of uh, respiratory rhythm so like this totally there are four different centers or four different areas that which regulate the rate of respiration so the respiratory movements are regulated in man by means of the neural systems the first one is respiratory rhythm center respiratory rhythm center is situated in the medulla oblongata region of the brain where it is the main center that which control the normal breathing process the respiratory normal respiratory rhythms are controlled by respiratory rhythm center of medulla oblongata and the pneumotoxic center is the one that which is present in pons varoli which is a part of brain stem or a hin brain so this pneumotoxic center will give signals to the respiratory rhythm center so thereby reducing the duration of inhalation and thereby modifying the respiration process
and next coming to chemo sensitive area this chemo sensitive area is present adjacent to the respiratory rhythm center and uh, this is responsible for detecting the changes in co2 and h plus ion concentration that means whenever co2 and h plus ion concentration increases then it will give uh, signals to the respiratory rhythm center in order to make necessary adjustments so to remove this excess co2 and then h plus ions by means of uh, breathing and uh, even the receptors chemoreceptors which are present in carotid arch and then aortic arch so they are also sensitive to co2 and h plus ion concentration and they also become responsible to give signals thereby uh, altering the rate of respiration so like this the respiratory movements are or respiratory rhythms are regulated in man so this is important saq in the next class we will discuss other important saqs which are present in the human respiratory system chapter so with this we will end up with uh, with this session hope that you are all clear and uh, thank you